Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Some other folks may, uh, may join us uh, as we go. But welcome to the uh, Supply Chain Logistics and Shipping Panel Discussion. And for those of you who are supposed to be in, a, in another session, thank you for accidentally uh, selecting ours. <laughs> uh, I'm Jeff Pratt. I'm the head of the uh, BDO, uh, the US Supply Chain Consulting Group. And uh, I'm acting as the, the moderator for our panel discussion. And uh, the, the, the focus of today's discussion will be on supply chain logistics, uh, some of the, the developing uh, technologies, uh, you know, th uh, services provided by third-party logistics providers, uh, and, and um, uh, you know, some of the emerging issues that are affecting supply chains. Um, and what we bring uh, with, the, with our panel, we have a diverse set of perspectives uh, that, that we, uh, we bring to the discussion. And, and our, our thought for today's discussion is to um, you know, in, introduce the panel so, so you can understand the perspective that each panelist is bringing and uh, we'll share some, some questions and some answers and some of the emerging issues uh, that, are, that are really affecting um, uh, supply chains. And, and then we're gonna turn it to, uh, to the audience fairly quickly because we're really, you know, it's, it's about what you wanna hear and we'll open up to questions. We'll have people uh, you know, uh, going through the room with, uh, with microphones uh, you know, so that we can hear the questions you have. And, and um, so, so with that, I'll ask each panelist to give a bit of background on uh, their role in their organization so, so you can see the diversity of the, uh, the perspectives that we're bringing. Uh, Ned? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. 2.30 is a tough time, right, right after lunch. So I want you guys to make sure you're engaged, ask questions. We look forward to that. Uh, by education, my background is in finance, and then um, I segued over to the dark side about 10 years ago in operations and supply chain. I've never looked back. It's been a hell of a ride. So I work for uh, Continental Automotive. I run uh, manufacturing as well as supply chain for North America. For those of you who do not know who Continental is, I'll just take uh, 90 seconds and just give you a very high-level overview. Um, we develop uh, emerging technologies uh, in connected mobility. And our company has been around since 1871. We're very proud of our product portfolio. Uh, we deliver safe, intelligent, efficient, and cost affordable technologies in many different industries. We provide, well, you heard this morning, uh, in terms of autonomous driving, that's one of our forefront technologies, directly into vehicles. Um, products directly into machines, the traffic uh, industry, as well as transportation. Last year, we had about 44 billion in revenue in terms of euros. We employ uh, 250,000 fantastic uh, people. And to bring it a little bit closer to home for this panel, we are in 22 states here uh, in the United States in terms of manufacturing. We have 46,000 people in the region. And if I just look at our automotive divisions, our three automotive divisions, which is our powertrain division, uh, our chassis uh, division, uh, as well as our interior division, we partner with about 6,000 suppliers worldwide, and we handle roughly 140 billion components in a year. So we're extremely diverse. Whether you're talking uh, amongst states, amongst borders, across the ocean, as my panelists will, will allude to, very diverse, ever-changing, very fluid. Look forward to your questions a little later on. Excellent. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Darren Bonney. I'm the CEO of MyFreight. We're an Australian privately owned business based in Melbourne in Australia. We started our business 28 years ago as a freight broker, a freight reseller, or commonly known these days with the buzzword as freight managers. <clears throat> so we're a non-asset based freight management business. We ventured into uh, a startup software business five years ago. So within our corporation, we built a cloud-based freight management system, a system that now sees almost 500 integrated transport and supply chain businesses interface with our system and our clients. And with that comes a lot of uh, in and out uh, data and, and of course connections across ERPs and financial uh, systems across all of our clients. We currently push through $137 million worth of freight uh, just in Australia alone. We've just uh, ventured into New Zealand. 
we decided to take the step into a neighbouring country first and dip our toe in the water. It's our client base that's actually driving our, the demand for our business to grow our software platform. And where my freight sits on the panel today is not just from a software and technology point of view, but we too as a business has done all the due diligence just like some of the people in the crowd today that are actually looking to invest in the US. And based on demand with a non-asset based business, we were challenged by American businesses uh, and North American businesses to, to uh, set up office in the US. So with that, we've done all that due diligence, we've made all the hard decisions that a lot of you people in the audience have to make. And not only that, but we've also had to realign ourselves and work with all the transport companies that we've done remotely effectively from Australia and New Zealand for so many years. So understanding that supply chain, reacquainting ourselves with the landscape here and regenerating new relationships. So I look forward to um, sitting on the panel this afternoon. Thank you. Hans. Hans Hilgenstock. Uh, Hans Hilgenstock, very, very German. Moved over 2001 to San Diego. Uh, with, at that point, two kids, pregnant wife. Uh, my son was born in San Diego, beautiful. 2004, I was forced to move to Charlotte, North Carolina. Didn't like it at all, kept the house in San Diego. Thought I would go back to paradise when I have the green card. Never did. Paradise, Charlotte. And actually, the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance told me I get a beer when I say Charlotte. Um, so I worked for Kudenagel, a logistics company. Uh, we like to say the leading global logistics company in the world, about 80,000 employees, 1,400 offices. I just realized that I had to change my signature because it still says 72, and I think that was about two years old. So we're grown. Um, we do this with a passion. I'm in charge for the Southeast, for Europe, so transatlantic, import, export, ocean, air, customs brokerage, trucking, whatever it is. I'm focusing on uh, multiplying with my sales team in the Southeast, but I'm also very involved in, in North and South Carolina, um, where I have own accounts, which I'm not supposed to have, but I do, and I appreciate Continental to help us. Um, we ship actually quite a bit of tires, um, so I'm looking forward to talk to you. If we cannot answer any question today, right here in this panel, please reach out to me outside. Thank you. I'm good. Good day, I'm good. Um, I think I'm in the wrong room. I didn't know this was the logistics. No, I am in the room. <laughs> uh, I work. My life just got harder. <laughs> <laughs> I work with UPS. I've been uh, with UPS 29 years now. I uh, started as a driver with UPS and have rotated through a lot of the functions that you've already heard about, finance, uh, strategy, mergers, acquisitions, operations, sales, um, and learned a lot and gained about 31 pounds through that journey. <laughs> I thought I'd share with this lovely group. I, uh, my responsibilities now uh, revolve around policy, uh, global trade policy, as well as borders. So I have a team of people that work on issues related to at the border problems and behind the border. And how do you change regulations and policies to enable your businesses to more fluidly get in and out of countries? So relative to what you're sitting here and hearing about, um, I spend a lot of time on, a, on an agreement called uh, TPP, which you might recall, now called CPTPP. Um, just finished up with USMCA, the, the new NAFTA, and have worked on many other digital agreements. So I look forward to talking to you a little bit about that um, and what we do for small and medium-sized businesses that try to relocate to the United States. Okay, Donovan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Donovan Murray with the Maryland Port Administration, I'm the general manager of Intermodal Trade Development. Uh, so for those of you in the room, unlike uh, the esteemed panelists here, uh, that have joined us on stage. Uh, I'm sort of with the home team. So uh, the Port of Baltimore, just right up the road, less than an hour away. Uh, by way of background, uh, I went to the Merchant Marine Academy, uh, which for those of you that don't know is similar to the Naval Academy, uh, with all the military bearing and, and the, the, uh, the requirements from that component. 
Uh, but rather than training young men and women to be officers on naval vessels, we're trained to be officers uh, on commercial merchant ships as well as the land side support. Uh, so I've spent most of my career in the private industry, uh, similar to some of the other panelists here, in various roles from operations, sales, administration, risk management, et cetera, uh, and just recently transitioned over to the public sector, if you will, uh, with the Maryland Port Administration falling directly under Maryland state government. So at the end of the day, our role is really that of facilitation uh, to make sure all the stakeholders in a port community and or extended port community, uh, in this case an international one, have all the resources available to them to make those connection points uh, and leverage those relationships for the movement of cargo through the port. Uh, Baltimore statistically ranks number ninth in the United States in tonnage and number 11 in value. Uh, although we are not the largest container port, uh, I would say we are quite a diverse port, handling uh, over 20 million tons of bulk cargo a year. We're also the nation's number one RORO, or roll-on, roll-off port in the nation. So that's automobiles, that's tractors, combines, things that you think of driving on and off a ship. Look forward to the questions. Thank you. Um, one question that may be good to start with, you know, get, given that we've we probably got folks in the room who are considering locating uh, operations in the U.S. Um, uh, I'm glad you've, you've probably seen uh, organizations be successful in locating new operations in the U.S. and, and you know, some who have been not so successful. Um, could you uh, uh, share some of those examples and maybe compare and contrast uh, what, what went right and what helped those organizations that were successful? Sure, I'm gonna make a couple of assumptions depending on your company size. So I would just say to you, if you know, you're VLM, you're a very large multinational, again, you might be in the wrong room because um, I would say the VLMs or the very large multinationals probably have the resources to withstand what we'd call a long tail of investment, right? You're gonna take profits, uh, a journey to get to profits, or to take losses for a long time. If you're an SMB, and you're thinking about your products, your services, and you want to relocate to the United States, I would tell you through the three decades of experience uh, that I've personally witnessed and then what we've learned at our company is you really want to now leverage, obviously, data, right? You, you don't want to take a blind shot or, or, or take a, a, a rudderless target shot at where you want to be, where you want to relocate, where your customer base is. And, if you're a retailer versus a B2B business, there's certainly different strategies. But I would tell you the bottom line is there's a plethora of data available to you. Start with Google Analytics to try to understand the buyer behavior of what your goods are, who's buying it in what region, when and for how long, how big is the customer base, who your competitors are. So I'm, you know, I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence. Obviously, I would tell you you need to do that as basic number one. And there's a lot of consultants, a lot of universities, and a lot of resources available to you for free in order to get that done. Once you've really done that, I think what we've seen our customer base do is not get too ambitious. And I, what I mean by that is you really want to ramp up properly. A lot of people, number of businesses jump in, get a lease, get brick and mortar, let's get this business started, let's pick out how many, where the VIP parking spots are, I would say to you, you, you might want to think about reversing that, right? You want to think about how to leverage the resources on this panel, how to use our infrastructure to your best benefit, and start off by leveraging the partnerships that are available to you. So I'll give you an example of a business that came out of London that we worked with that now has a footprint in the United States, had zero when they first started, and now has a footprint in the United States, about $200 million in revenue. And what they did is they were, in the old world, a mail order type business. In the new world, obviously, an internet business. And they figured out how to market to the different regions. And then from that marketing knowledge, ended up building densities, customer densities, through their different programmatic uh, processes. Once they've decided, or once they've actually witnessed and grown their revenue to the point where they can then put a facility, they didn't put a facility. They came to us and said, hey, do you have any room in your end of runway facilities? And use those end of runway facilities, the warehousing, pick, pack, and ship, for a period of about three years until they built even bigger densities. And then at that point, they put in their uh, tent pegs and built out their infrastructure. 
So through that growth process, which took four to seven years, depending on which area of the United States, they work with the regional economic development people of those states, secured grants, built their buildings, hired their people, and went from there. So there, there's many different formulas, but I chose that one because it, it seemed to me a story that made sense on how to grow in a low risk way, <clears throat> but still leverage everything that's available to you here in the United States. There's so much opportunity. I'll, I'll stop there and we can launch from there. Thank you. And Hans Amgad mentioned you know, some of the, uh, the key uh, you know, sort of um, uh, mathematical and, uh, and uh, you know, optimization activities that need to happen uh, to, to select the right uh, you know, logistics footprint. Uh, would you like to comment on that and, and uh, Absolutely. discuss some of the I mean, key factors? It, it depends on what, what your business looks like. Um, do you bring in ocean freight, bring in air freight, bring in small packages, big packages, crates, brake bulk? So when you come to the United States, you definitely want to have a look and also from the logistics uh, point of view when you uh, select a site. ELD, electronic login device, will not allow any driver to drive more than 14 hour, 14 hour duty time, 11 hours driving time. This is kind of new, about a one and a half year old. Before, drivers were not allowed to drive longer, but they had a pen and a piece of paper and wrote it down. And guess what they did? They drove 30 hours <laughs> just to make sure they get paid faster and meet the deadline. Well, that's over. ELD is there. They get fined and penalized, so we cannot play around with this anymore. So if you have ocean freight, and you're considering the United States as a future site, then please do not be further away than 200 to 250 miles, because you can make the round trip with a container in about 14 hour duty time. Maybe it's 300 miles, but you're pushing it. If you cannot make this round trip, you pay layover fee, 300, 350, $400. Depends on the trucking company. So you want to think about this. If you bring in two containers a year, who cares? But if you bring in 20, 30, 40, and you want to grow, and you want to bring in 100 in three years, think about it. Then air freight. Um, again, I'm, I think I get paid already four beers. I say again, Charlotte, sorry for that. Um, Charlotte has, I picked Charlotte. I could go anywhere in the southeast, but I picked Charlotte because it has the airport. It was close to the port of Charleston, Savannah, Wilmington, Norfolk. I can use all four if I have to. And I have interstates, lots of interstates. So I can go and distribute my freight, my packages, whatever I want, everywhere. So I knew in this area, the greater North South Carolina, the great area around Charlotte, there are customers, a lot of customers for me, who need my service, Kuranago service. So air freight, you want to make sure you're close to the airport with good connections, not one, two, three regional flights. We're talking about good connections. Make sure that you consider all these things before you say, oh, I'm in XYZ in no man's land. Yes, you got the land for free. And yes, you got incentives. And yes, it's all sweet and dandy. But you struggle to find the people who work for you, and you cannot get your freight on a reasonable cost. Thank you. Uh, Donovan Hans mentioned the selection of ports. Uh, could, mm -hmm. could you talk a bit about the changing role and the value of ports uh, in, in the supply chain selection and, and uh, globalization process? Yeah, absolutely. And I, th I think I'll touch on uh, both the previous answers uh, in that. So. Uh, for the folks that have been in, in the shipping or what is now supply chain industry for many years, uh, you've seen a lot of, of drastic and, and radical changes. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, supply chain was really sort of an afterthought. Nobody really thought uh, how to effectively plan uh, the movement of goods and ultimately to uh, the, the, the consumer. Uh, and I think a lot of folks can point to folks like Walmart that differentiated themselves in that space versus companies like Sears or Kmart that failed to adapt to those changes and really understand uh, the savings that could be leveraged. Uh, even Amazon, everybody picks on them, but Jeff Bezos famously said that your margin is, is my opportunity. And so in that, within the supply chain, uh, ports have really changed their role. What used to be just a fixed node on a map and geographically every port could just count on a slice of the pie that they would receive just based on that ge geography and consumer market, 
uh, that has really shifted, that ports have taken on a much more active role in, in the management and the customers and the relationships uh, of what's moving through their port and connecting them to uh, that ultimate consumer. So when you're looking at that connection point in a supply chain, it's no longer a fixed node, but we're as, as a port, we're as integrated into the supply chain as your trucker or your rail provider uh, or your freight forwarder or your, your uh, data analytics folks. Uh, that, that To echo what, what uh, was said earlier, yes, data is important, but the business still comes down a lot of times to relationships, and you want to make sure that you partner with ports that have those relationships and that can really set through facilitation the connections to your truckers or your rails or your terminals or your shippers uh, or those various points along the supply chain. Because the last thing you want to do when you're trying to grow your business is worry about that component. And again, back to the earlier point, leveraging the relationships of folks in that supply chain to really do that work for you. Thank you. And I'll stop there. And, and Darren, you talked about some of the emerging technologies that you've helped launch into the supply chain process. Uh, could, could you, uh, um, you know, re reflecting on, on what the guys have, uh, have talked about uh, in terms of some of the key considerations, uh, share with us how big data and, and some of the new e-commerce platforms are, are coming into play? Yes, yeah, certainly. <clears throat> well, when we look across the broader range of supply chain, um, data analytics is, is important for track and trace and, and visibility for businesses. Uh, B2B uh, transport movements are important, particularly in manufacturing areas, for example, uh, to make sure the pro that uh, products coming in on, in on time and um, uh, available for the next portion of your supply chain. So the data needs to be, uh, in our examples, uh, with our software is uh, integrating with um, with all the businesses that sit on this panel to track their freight from, from cradle to grave, so to speak, right down to last mile. And that's where e-commerce is really changing things now. Uh, we see it in the marketplace and for businesses, we're, we're very used to the demand on freight. We're aware of what our freight providers actually have to experience, whether it be uh, weather, whether it be a bad time of year, or let's call it Christmas, where demand is very high. But E-commerce and the, the last mile customer these days is really driving service expectations. Some of the issues we see now are, um, are things that businesses probably didn't uh, consider uh, when they were setting up their businesses, and that is things like returns of products. Uh, also, customers demand or, or see in the press modern technologies like, uh, like Uber Freight or, or led by Amazons. So they believe that, uh, that, their, that their order should be picked, packed and available the next day in the morning. Where businesses uh, have that high demand and understanding, the consumer's not. And where businesses, uh, where their clientele are consumers, you are experiencing that now. And that's where data does kick in with the requirement for, um, for last mile delivery apps or integrating with multiple uh, transport companies, systems, subcontractors, intermodal uh, systems, uh, starting right at the port when, when the freight first comes in. Um, so massive impacts right now really driven by e-commerce. Thank you. And Ned, as a, a very large automotive supplier, one of the largest in the world, you know, with all the, the services and the emerging technologies, how are you and your organization uh, staying abreast of those uh, to ensure competitiveness in 2020 and beyond? Yeah, I think it was already discussed a little bit, but I'll try to, uh, try to give you a supplier perspective uh, on this. Obviously, the transport management system is critical, right? A holistic view end-to-end -end is absolutely critical. But if you're smaller in size, it makes no sense for you to develop your own. Right? That is something that should be done with somebody already that, that has the expertise, and there's a couple of two or three of them sitting up here with me. But you have to look at actually other things in terms of your manufacturing process, your supply process. We are seeing more change in the next five years than I personally believe we have saw in the last 25 to 35 years. It is out there. It's not being talked about anymore. It is out there. The question is, do you want to be an innovator right, or a fast follower? And honestly, it depends on your individual strategy. 
Continental has decided, quite frankly, to be an innovator. Right? We are using cobots right now in our facilities, both in logistics as well as manufacturing, and it's working out very well. We use automated guided vehicles already, not in terms of just transporting paper from one side uh, of micro logistics to the other. Right? We are literally delivering pallets. We are literally delivering parts, et cetera, uh, from our warehouses. Uh, you know, the smart glasses are out there. Geofencing is out there. The RFID technology is a thing of the past. As soon as geofencing technology has a price point where it's more, it has a better appetite, you're going to see the integration into your financial systems. You're going to be able to track and trace everything. It is going to be phenomenal. The question is your strategy in your, in your company. What is your pallet? What are you able to invest? I guarantee there's an ROI in one of the emerging technologies, I didn't even talk about big data analytics. It's crazy, and predictive forecasting. It is all right there. The question is, in terms of your individual company and your strategy, what are you willing to invest in and what ROI are you looking for? But uh, in my opinion, and, and I saw this maybe six months ago, just very quickly, I was at a presentation. Somebody showed me a warehouse from the 1950s. And they just showed me a warehouse, this, a warehouse picture taken the week before the presentation. The only difference, unfortunately, is that one was black and white and one was in color. And I'll <laughs> tell you, that will change. Wow. Right? The warehousing is going to be the future technology. We are going to grasp it. We are going to find savings. And honestly, what you see in the next five years will surpass what you've seen in the last 20. I am convinced of it. Thank you. Uh, with, with that, what we'd like to do is, is turn the uh, discussion to the audience and ask you if you have specific questions for the panelists. Um, the, the one thing that we talked about that we'd like to stay away from because uh, the, there's so much up in, up in the air with it uh, are uh, the, the impact of, of tariffs and some of the trade agreements that are being negotiated. In, in fact, there's another competing session that uh, you know, across the hall somewhere to discuss that. Uh, so that, that's one that's a little bit speculative, and, and uh, the, we'd like to stay away from it as a panel. If you have any questions, just raise your hand, and we'll bring the mic to you. So while, whilst it's quiet in the audience just now, I'll just chime <laughs> in uh, on the ed, end of Ned's uh, uh, conversation just then. Just, just highlighting the technology changes and the decisions that you're going to be making are going to be based on when you arrive in the USA. But be considerate of what's, what's out there in the next few years. Don't look too far ahead. The adoption of change for us, we all own a car apparently on average. And I get this from my data um, for 16 years on average. So, so we won't all be in electronic vehicles or automated vehicles or autonomous vehicles. Uh, for another 20 years. Um, we will see them out there, um, but they, we, we're possibly going to be watching them as well. So, um, so take your time on making a decision based on 2020, uh, rather the next few years. Hey, can you hear me? Hi, my name is Alex, I'm from Austria. Um, in the business of um, B2C logistics, so um, we're shipping for our clients basically across Europe, we have a warehouse network. What I'm looking for is basically we have a lot of clients shipping to the US and currently the setup is very efficient because I have to give it to FedEx or DHL is actually and it takes forever and costs a hell lot of money for our clients. So what I'm looking for is basically setting up a few strategic locations in the US to be able to, what we'd like to see, um, like a two-day delivery window. So my question is, um, uh, what's in your point on your like very specific question, I know, but um, B2C, what would be like a, a good setup to reach consumers across the US, basically? Okay, thank you. Um, Hans, do you want to? You, do you mean more like the location, or you mean like the setup as the infrastructure? Sorry, I was just screen. Um, <laughs> Okay. Um, again, there's a whole bunch of things we need to consider. Uh, are you bringing it in the ocean? Are you bringing it in the air? Sorry, I'll bring in pallets and ship parcels. Okay, so you bring in the pallet, air freight, or ocean? Um, both possible. Both possible. So predominantly, predominantly, it will be um, ocean. Ocean. So if it's predominantly ocean, um, as I said before, don't go too far away from a port. 
Uh, remember that 250 miles with 300 you're pushing your luck. Um, so make sure that's that's one key. I definitely, if you've, if it's your own operations, um, think about time zone. West Coast is beautiful. I live there. I still call it paradise, <laughs> but it's nine hours to Austria. I think it was Austria, correct? Austria. <laughs> yep. So it's it's tough to communicate to your own team. Um, so I would definitely stay on somewhere on the East Coast. Um, and then air freight, yes. If you want to be quick overnight, um, make sure you have interstates. And there's a whole bunch of amazing trucking companies out there. So make sure you have interstates and then make sure you have the airport. So basically what I said before, um, if you want to be quick, you got to have an airport. You have to have an airport with, there's so many. I mean, I don't want to count anything, but Atlanta, Ch Chicago, Charlotte, there's so many airports you can go to. Don't be 10 miles away. It's getting expensive. Go 30 miles away. You're fine. Thank you. Does it answer your question? I don't know. Yes. I think, yes, yeah, some of the other. <laughs> I was about to say that, but I should probably. I know a guy. I know a guy. So there's three primary colors playing in the United States, brown, purple, and yellow. I would just tell you all those primary colors on the East Coast have their major U.S. East Coast facility in either Louisville, Kentucky, or an hour away in Cincinnati. And that's because of the international date line and the time zones. And you could reach it within, to your point, geographically, uh, time and transit to the B2C customer. But I, here's a couple other things I'd tell you. Uh, because of changes in 2015 to US law to allow an $800 inbound de minimis per item without paying any duties, there's this whole other layer of e-commerce that's now uh, evolving in the United States. So one of the things I think I would like to talk to you without a microphone about um, is we started a program at UPS called Where to Go, like Warehouse to Go. It's like uh, somebody said Uber. Um, it's, it's, we understand all the excess capacity in the United States now in warehouses and we certify pieces of warehouses to locate geo uh, uh, strategically based on where your clients' needs are, and it's very fluid. So especially if you're a reseller or you're providing the service, you might have in this region 400 customers today and 200 shift to over here tomorrow. You can nebulously now move your warehouses depending. So, there's a lot of opportunities now with technology and transparency enabling you to be very fluid in your real estate. Obviously, you're paying a bit of a premium, and I wouldn't say um, you know, to use that exclusively as your uh, source, but it allows you the flexibility to, to serve your customers. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Did, did you have a, a comment or question? I just want to listen from his ideas. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, anything from a port perspective? Yeah, d d the only thing I would add from a port perspective, and really it echoes Hans's earlier comment, uh, you want to make sure, and particularly for the C of your model, getting to the ultimate consumer, which, let's face it, is really all of us at our homes, whether that's Amazon or whatever method gets to our homes, uh, you want to make sure you look at census data in the United States and understand where all those Cs are, where all the consumers are. Uh, so again, just because we're in the port business, we happen to know New York, New Jersey area, by far the largest in the United States, Southern California, number two, Chicago metro area, number three. We actually sit in the middle of the fourth largest in the United States, the Baltimore-Washington corridor. So as you look at that international strategy, you want to make sure that you do have good port and air resources, and that's also in a, in a population-dense area so that you've got plenty of, of sale capacity there. Sure. Absolutely. <clears throat> Could you speak about the impact of the Panama Canal expansion? Are you seeing any trends with the ports? Sure, I'll take that. Uh, so when you look at Panama Canal expansion, uh, you, you really have to divide the United States in half. And, and it, it really depends on where you're sourcing your product from and ultimately where that 
strategy is to sell in the United States, whether it's B2B or, again, uh, back to the ultimate consumer. Uh, clearly, the West Coast has, is receiving larger ships than what can transit the Panama Canal. 14,000 plus is about the largest that you'll see on the East Coast of the United States, uh, in part not only because of the size of the canal, but you also look at, at the distribution and somewhat fractured nature of the East Coast of the United States. More population, more ports. Uh, most people believe that while the Panama Canal at 14,000 TEUs limits ship size, which again is still a monster ship compared to what we had just 10, 15 years ago, uh, the, the nature of the trans-Pacific trade that lends itself to much larger vessels, sometimes it, which is a rarity, a true pure dump in a, in a load back in a Southern California port that you won't find on the East Coast. 14,000 TEU seems to be that, that accepted size of ship that we'll call the East Coast, not only because of Panama Canal limitations, but also just because of, of port infrastructure. When you look up and down the East Coast, uh, New York, New Jersey, they raised the Bayonne Bridge, you may have heard about, to the tune of a couple billion dollars, uh, which was no cheap investment. Uh, Norfolk, they're at 50 feet. Baltimore is at 50 feet as well. Charleston, I believe they're going to 54. Savannah is somewhat limited uh, with, with the tidal swing. So through all of that, on the land side, the ports are racing in this infrastructure war to get the cranes higher, taller, faster, wider, all of those things, more land expansion, more intermodal connectivity. But ultimately, the Panama Canal, yes, was able to bring goods here from primarily Asia to the East Coast in, in more economies of scale. Uh, but again, just based on a lot of those constraints that I mentioned earlier, 14,000 TEUs, probably the biggest that we'll see here on the East Coast. So as that tonnage cascades from the really the Asia to Europe trade lane into the Trans-Pacific will eventually make its way to the Transatlantic. Yes. Uh, my my oh. question is the specific to the truck drivers. I think, uh, Darren, you mentioned the autonomous truck driver won't be here for another 20 years. Uh, allow me to correct, correct you there, sir. So uh, it, it, is, it is here already. Uh, but you won't be driving one yourself in 20 years' time. So oh, okay. just as, as I was saying, um, and I'm speaking to the audience that's, that's looking to invest in the US, make your decisions based on what's currently here and what the next few years hold. Don't get caught up in, in the hype that we will all be operating and that we, uh, as a panel, will be operating autonomous vehicles on your behalf. We won't be just yet, but we're certainly driving... Uh, all of those new technologies in supply chain. Okay. We okay. do see it. We are seeing it. We're going to experience that. But I just say, just be ca just a caution that uh, the adoption rate with all of us actually operating autonomous vehicles, whilst our freight's moving just as fast, um, <coughs> is still a long way off. Okay. That's kind of my second question. Well, Ned, uh, Ned you do you want to comment on how you're using those technologies today? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit different. What I was referring to, it's actually two-sided. What I was referring to is AGVs, autonomous guided vehicles, within the factory, right, within micro-logistics. So obviously that's out there. But it's emerging technology, and, and quite frankly, there's a lot of opportunity today for that. Uh, but then to, to switch things out of the supply chain realm, uh, obviously Continental's a pioneer in, in autonomous driving, right? We believe in it, and we believe that it brings uh, safety and uh, uh, although I hate to disagree, I think, I think that penetration rate will be a little bit quicker. Uh, but we'll, we will see, right? And I do think it'll be in all segments, personal segment as well as the, the trucking segment as well. So I, I personally am is very excited about it, and I think there's a heck of a lot of opportunity for all of us. That's my follow-up question is the truck driver is the number one most highly turnover profession. And then I also noticed the truck driver are getting very, very aggressive on the highway. They just changing lens like crazy. So my question to you guys is, uh, any way you can make that number one turnover profession to <laughs> much more stable, so they won't be driving like crazy? Um, <laughs> I, I cannot talk to the drivers when they drive crazy. <laughs> um, I talked about ELD. I believe ELD was way overdue. Um, I almost lost a friend on the interstate because the driver just crashed into him. Finally, to find out he fell asleep. So long story short, um, the drivers, 
The average driver age right now is 57 in the United States. So don't wait eight years till they're 65 and then they retire. They will retire in the next two, three years. Um, I know for Charleston that a lot of container truck drivers live in Charleston. Well, guess what? There's Volvo, Boeing, and Dama trucks. Instead of being under stress all the time, never see the baseball practice of your son or the dance class of your da daughter, and make only 40, 45,000, sometimes 35,000 without benefits, very often, you go to Volvo, clock in at 8 o'clock, clock out at 5 o'clock, get $55,000, $60,000 benefit package. So guess what? We're not finding any driver. If you're young and a little bit smart, you're not driving a truck. Um, but we, what I can say, um, don't want to pitch any sales here, but Kunanagel pays right now. There's a, a daily update on market level. We decided to pay $75 more at least per truck. 75. So if the rate on that lane is right now, I know it's a good number, $1,000, we pay $1,075. The drivers know that. It's an extra, I hope they get it in their pocket, <laughs> but it's an extra 75 because we make sure that we get the service we need. And I know that the other competitors do a very similar thing. We have to understand that all of us, including myself, maybe have to pay 1% percent more on my product so that we have the infrastructure, that we have trucks, that we have things in our stores. I don't think it takes 1%. It takes much less. But we need to pay a little bit more to these drivers so they get the job done right. So I'm just going to add two cents worth because UPS is the largest private fleet in the United States. And I started as a driver and I survived. <laughs> and I would just tell you um, what's really important, what we're lobbying the U.S. government on is creating an apprenticeship program mm -hmm. to really leverage, you know, what some of our partners in Europe do really well, which is raise people to want this job and create the benefit package for the job. Uh, UPS for the last 111 years designed a network where drivers leave in the morning and go back at night and sleep in their own bed. Even though we're moving 6% of the US GDP every day, we figured out how to configure a network so that they switch and come back to their home every day. So you also got to, you know, there's a lot of responsibility on the company to figure out how to be viable, make a profit, serve your customers, but also serve your employees. So that's my answer. Final thought on that as well, in addition, as Amgad said, raising young folks to want to be drivers. In a regulatory environment, we also then need to lower the threshold or that barrier of entry. Here in the United States, you need to be 21 to have a, uh, a CDL, a commercial driver's license. Ironically, though, uh, within state borders, an 18-year-old can drive much farther uh, with a, uh, an equivalent weight load than they could 10 minutes across state lines. So again, that, that becomes somewhat of a regulatory issue. Uh, also from an insurance standpoint, and this is where we get into the practical real world nuts and bolts, many commercial underwriters require two years of experience before they will issue insurance to said driver. So how does that driver actually get the requisite experience if they don't get any wheel time? So again, right now that's actually within the zip code that we're sitting in, somewhere in the bowels of Washington wrestling with that idea how to actually get younger folks in, in new blood into the industry. So as Hans said, 57 years old, drivers aren't getting any younger. And we need them, we really do. Yes. Um, There's one over there. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, Jose Burns from the American Chamber of Commerce of Mexico. Um, so we help American companies invest in Mexico and Mexican companies invest in the US. Right here, it's all good. <laughs> So uh, two questions. Number one, have you seen any trends on or evolution in the supply chain or logistics from Mexico and the United States? I know at least from the companies we advise, there's been a lot of uh, movement on trucks, but there's been a push for using the ports, which I hadn't seen, or at least in my experience, I hadn't seen. So can you talk on the trends? And secondly, is there any circumstance where you would recommend the company use a strategy to use the NAFTA or the new USMCA to get the merchandise first into Mexico and then use those free trade agreements to get it into the United States? Thank you. Did you want to sure. So I'll take it quick because I see we're flashing here. Um, I, I would just tell you, if you haven't done your research, 
the new USMCA is actually going to create a great opportunity for North American trade. In the automotive supply chain, there's obviously going to be a lot of new opportunities. One of the problems we've had in the last 25 years since the US uh, NAFTA was signed is there's been this whole cottage industry on the southern border where American drivers of trucks can't cross all the way from, let's say, Dallas down to Mexico City. They're on, in the LTL business or in the small package business. We have to consolidate loads. We have to have one broker cross the border with a consolidated load. You have to unload load. It takes four trucks to get across the U.S.-Mexico border. All that is going away with the new USMCA. There's going to be a more fluid supply chain of legitimate goods between the two countries. So I would just double down on what you said. You need to look at, once it's ratified and passed, how your business model chain changes for how you're going to exist in the North American space between Canada, United States, and Mexico. So it's a complex question to answer. Circumstances will dictate it, but we're going to be in a new day within the next few months. Okay. And, and we do have about uh, 10 more minutes. Oh, excellent. Thank you. So could I dovetail the, the oh, second yeah, part of that question? Okay. From, a, from an automotive uh, manufacturing perspective, I have to echo what was just said. Uh, we see opportunity in the USMCA, and, and I personally do not see a logistics, uh, a major shift in logistics change, right, to, from the ports or, or coming through the U.S. versus Mexico. <laughs> I, I really don't see that. Uh, so again, the devil's in the details, right? So we'll have to see when it's actually uh, ratified. Uh, but we see it as an opportunity right now. Mm -hmm. So for, for ours for our purposes, we absolutely believe to be in the region for the region. That is a, a legitimate strategy that we have, and we're not going to change that strategy. I think we had a, another question here. Uh, hello, this is Fuad Krishan, FKSE, uh, UAE. My question is, if you are bringing a product to the U.S. and you want to create a presence in the U.S., we have the product in one end and the consumer in the other end. How much in between can be outsourced or and how much of it uh, need to be do it, do it your, yourself? Um, do, you, do you want to start with that as a, from a supply perspective? My apologies. Re repeat your question again, if you don't mind, if you can give him the, the mic again, please. I thought it was more from a LSP perspective, but go ahead. Okay, okay. Yeah. Could, could be. Uh, bringing products to, to, to the U.S. with the, bringing the products first to the U.S. and then to the consumer. So we have the product in one end and the consumer in the other. How much of the process can be outsourced and how much you can do it yourself? Like, do I need to have a warehouse and do the packing and then give it to y your company or this can be outsourced or... What is it that we can outsource? I think it's maybe, more. Yeah, maybe good LSP. to start with Hans on that. I'm in sales, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> All can be outsourced. <laughs> it's a very simple answer. Right. Please, let's meet outside. We use everything. Now, uh, it all depends on your product and uh, what's, what is built in for logistics. The cost, you know, it's cost. So, we can do basically everything. I mean, we can iron shirts, we can put them on a hanger, we put a little label on it, and we change labels. And I'm just giving you one example for fashion. We can do everything. When I say we, the industry, it, not only Kununaga, it, Schenker, Panopina, name them all. They can do this. The question is, what can your product allow? Because it's, it's money involved, it's not cheap. Um, when you come to the United States, I can give you one advice. Number one, don't make the mistake you're not gonna make and hire a German salesperson. Look for an American <laughs> salesperson because sales in America is different. But outsource as much as you can. Work and focus on your key market, your customers. Service them, be there. Do whatever you wanna do with them. Let other people do your homework, your logistics, your accounting, your taxes, your legal, outsource it. That's key. I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples. We have people on the factory floors in other countries pre-labeling goods for customers, consolidating it based on our knowledge in the United States, and importing it, acting as the importer of record on company's behalf, distributing, handling returns, repackaging, relabeling, and sending out. So that's an example. 
We work for another laptop company, your laptop fries anywhere in the United States. We take it, we take out the data, put it on another laptop, send you the laptop within 24 hours, you have a new laptop with all your original data. So the cycle of the opportunity is endless. But there's a curve where your costs versus our costs meet in the middle, and it's a Venn diagram, and you go, okay, I've reached the point where I need to either outsource this piece or I need to do all these pieces myself. I love your comment about focusing on your core competencies. A number of years ago, 15 years ago, UPS went to all the pharmaceutical companies. They're not in the business of marketing, and, oh, sorry, in distribution. They're in creation and marketing. We now warehouse all of the pharmaceuticals. We have a whole healthcare discipline because that's what we do. We're a logistics company. So figure out your strengths, especially when you're growing. Focus on that and then, uh, and then outsource what you can. And maybe one more thing. There's actually a whole bunch of service providers who do exactly what you need. Uh, I know one company can come to me and what they do is they pick up the phone for you and they will say XYZ imports, your company's name. They do the accounting, they do everything, they wear everything. So you can be on the road selling your products wherever you want. And there's not only one company doing this, there's a whole bunch. I know one. <laughs> Thank you. They're good. And we, and we have just a couple of minutes and I'm sure any of the panelists would be happy to stay behind if you have specific, specific questions. And I think you probably have the contact information for all the panelists in your, in your uh, summit material as well, correct? So, I'm sorry? So, so with that, did you want to? Uh, There's one. I'm sorry. Oh, one more question, okay. Um, so I work in economic development in, uh, Duluth, in the area surrounding Duluth, Minnesota, which is the farthest inland port in uh, the, Great L the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway system, uh, number one uh, cargo port on the Great Lakes, uh, served by four, four class one rail, um, intermodal container between truck and rail. What trends do you see as important for international shipping on the Great Lakes? And where, how, where do you see the Great Lakes in the global uh, supply chain right now? And in the next five years or so? Okay. Donovan, did you want to? Well, we're, we both work in the port space, obviously in, in two different ends of it. Uh, while we're at the northern end of the Chesapeake Bay, we don't have the, the constraints that you necessarily have with the lock infrastructure and the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, you know, the, I believe it's 59 feet or so in, in, in breadth uh, or width on a ship. Uh, so the, we're, we're not limited in, in that capacity. Uh, but in terms of, of changing environment, um, I'm not the expert. Perhaps Amgad could, could speak to the, the new NAFTA, if you will, if, if that creates opportunity for you in that environment. Uh, from Canada to the United States. Uh, I think part of that also goes back to uh, some of the other comments that, that we had discussed in terms of, of ultimate consumption. What, what is the driver of that trade? Is it industry? Is it consumer? Where do those two meet? And how can the port play a role in that? So I'm not giving you a great answer and a direct answer to the question. I've always thought, yeah. um, you know, I grew up part of my life in Canada. I've always thought the Great Lakes is a great opportunity because um, I would tell you now, especially Canada signed an agreement with Europe, CETA, um, and Canada obviously signed the agreement with the United States and Mexico. I think Canada is kind of uh, in the vortex, and especially the Great Lakes, because you would know 70% of the economic development in Canada is around the Great Lakes. The manufacturing sector, especially in automotive, uh, hydropower, and um, the proximity and logistics really provide a strategic opportunity for northeastern United States and uh, Canada. I tell, I'll tell you what's missing. There's an organization on the West Coast called PENWAR, uh, Pacific Northwest Economic, uh, I can't remember what the R stands for. It's a number of provinces and states that re decided regionally we're an economic powerhouse and we're going to work together and cooperate. That's missing, in my belief, in the Great Lakes region. And if you were to do anything, I think it's figure out under the new USMCA and under CETA and under the 
whatever new uh, Japan-US agreement or Japan-China agreement, how do you turn that region into the powerhouse it needs to be based on the infrastructure that it has? Jeff, Thank one you. final thing on that. Uh, you had mentioned four class one railroads that call your port right now. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the notion of precision scheduled railroading that started in Canada with Hunter Harrison with both CN and CP and then eventually migrated to CSX, that tenant now is, is starting to take hold in all of the US class one railroads. Uh, and they're actually forming partnerships to, to get around the pinch point of Chicago. Uh, I would make sure that you protect your origin and or destination uh, in Duluth as the Western railroads are starting to embrace the tenets of PSR. Uh, when, when you look at the Western half of the United States or Western two thirds, it, it's laid out very logical in a linear fashion when you think about the history of the migration West. But east of the Mississippi River, it's sort of this hodgepodge. It, it looks like a big bowl of pasta where you have all these short lines and in, in interconnection points. And we've seen hundreds of origin and destination pairs just get turned off. When I say turned off, literally overnight or the next week, the railroad just calls a customer and says, I'm sorry, I can't service your port anymore. Best of luck. So uh, just to maybe in a defensive play, make sure you have that open dialogue with, with your railroad partners to protect that origin and destination service. Okay. Thanks uh, to all of our panelists. And uh, thank you all. We've kept you a bit late, but we appreciate your, uh, your time.